Uh, we ask that you would say something to us that we can take with us as we depart and bring all of this into perspective for us. May your will be done, and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, if you have your Bibles, look with me in the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 13. I want to say just a few things to help put all of this into perspective, and uh, then we're going to go and uh, have lunch. And uh, I won't speak long, I promise, because... I'm not used to having the choir behind me, so that makes me, it just weirds me out, so I can't, just can't, I'm not even going to look at them. So, 150 years, so let's put some of this into perspective. Here's some interesting things that took place in 1873 that are relevant. So first of all, the American Indian Wars an ongoing conflict that would last for a decade or so was just beginning in earnest, primarily in the American Midwest and in the Northwest, uh, and it did not begin well for the United States, although they would end up uh, devastating the culture, Native Americans, and rounding them up into the reservation. Also in 1873, Ulysses S. Grant was beginning his second term as President of the United States. And if you think the scandals in our current lifetime are bad, they're nothing compared to what President Grant endured. He did not judge character very well. Also, in May of 1873, Henry Rose exhibits barbed wire at an Illinois county fair. Later, a couple of guys named Joseph Glidden and Jacob Haish invented a machine that could mass produce it. And when that happened, the cattle and real estate markets were never the same, especially in Texas. And in 1873, what's called the Long Depression begins in October. It's a worldwide recession that lasted in eight, until 1879 and until 1896 in some places. Now, in the United States... In 1873, the Long Depression was known as the National Panic, and its effects could be felt right here in Rockport. The families who helped establish this community, like the Mathis family and the families of George W. Fulton, were busy making Rockport a cattle town. And their vision was to raise cattle nearby, slaughter them here in town, and then ship them out by rail and by steamboat. They had experienced quite a bit of success. They drew businesses to the community, workers to the new city, but when the national panic hit, it devastated Aransas County financially and especially the city of Rockport. It created miserable economic conditions on the Live Oak Peninsula for years to come, lasting at least, oh, until today. I don't know. <laughs> and it was in those miserable bleak economic conditions that the Baptists who had been meeting here on the peninsula finally decided that what this community needed most was an official Baptist church. And so they organized. And while the conditions were not ideal, they believed that they could help provide a gospel witness to the times in which, uh, in which they lived. Now, the first 50 years of the church were tough indeed, marked by economic hardships, Baptist infighting, the Spanish flu pandemic, World War I, and the hurricane of 1919. Now, we've heard that the church started with about 60 members. By the time the, the hurricane of 1919 destroyed the church, there were 10 members left. And they started again. And now look where we are today. That wasn't a clapping moment. To hold your applause. <laughs> Some might say the next 100 years of the church weren't a whole lot better. Now, the economic rebound of the 1920s ended with the Great Depression. Then we have uh, armed conflicts around the globe. World War II, Korea and Vietnam and Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Members of this church have felt the loss in all of these conflicts. 
The ebb and flow of the shipping industry led to fluctuating economic realities locally, leading to good times and bad. As Charles pointed out, uh, our society has changed dramatically in the 20th century, and right here in this community, uh, Charles was a champion for equal rights in the civil rights movement. And he faced a lot of people in this community who disagreed in the equality between the races. He's a hero, and we just don't know what he endured personally. See, Charles' works both ways. Uh, Charles is a hero for the way that he stood for Christ and for equality during that turbulent time. We've mentioned hurricanes. I won't mention those. I'm sick of them. <laughs> Through it all, the Lord has sustained this congregation and this community. In the last 30 years, this church focused hard on its mission, relocating to this present location from downtown, a piece of property that Esther Lockhart said was a nice piece of high ground. <laughs> that tickles me every time I hear that. Yeah. The church organized around its mission to lead all people to be shaped by the love of Christ, allowing that mission to define our actions during good times and challenging times. And so the question before us as we wrap all this up today is after 150 years, where do we go from here? And 50 years ago, when they had the, the centennial celebration, Charles asked the same question, where do we go from here? The answer to what comes next can be found at least in part by understanding not just our present, but also our past. So to help us to do that for a few minutes, let's look at this interesting description of a moment in time where God's people were leaving slavery behind in Egypt and were about to begin the journey to the land of promise. So I'm going to read in Exodus chapter 13, beginning with verse 17. And it says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, If they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So if we're going to understand where we go from here, it's important for us to understand not just our present, but our past as well. And so let's begin by looking at the present. Here's the first thing I want you to know. Israel's present was confusing and discouraging, but in reality, they were experiencing God's loving protection and provision. In the text, it tells us that they were leaving Egypt behind. The Israelites had lived in Egypt for about 500 years. They were leaderless. They'd been enslaved. They knew only the Egyptian culture and lifestyle in which they lived. They were victims of the world's greatest political, military, and economic power. They were not used to direct guidance from God. They did not understand who he was. They did not understand what it meant to be in his presence or the power that was among them. Because of their ignorance of God, they were not seeing things correctly. And so you have all throughout the book of Exodus, Numbers, and Leviticus, uh, and Deuteronomy, that they're asking if God is good and powerful, uh, he surely will not allow his people to go through troubles, dangers, and griefs, and testings right? And the answer is right. <laughs> they were just beginning to face many, many hardships, including almost immediately the Egyptian army who would corner them at the Red Sea. Here's what's important. God was at work to bring his people to a right relationship with him to teach them to trust his provision for them. 
See, in verse 17, it's clear that God led them on an irregular route out of Egypt in order to avoid the Philistines who lived along the easiest route. And I've been a pastor a while now. I can hear in my mind what they were saying. Why aren't we taking the shorter route? It's already after 1230. Why aren't we taking the shorter route? I can hear it. Oh. You're taking us the long way. God could have destroyed the Philistines on behalf of the Israelites. Obviously, that is true. But the Philistines had done nothing to Israel at this point, unlike Egypt. And so Israel was not ready to face them. Now, the Philistines would be dealt later according to God's perfect timing. But at this point, God knew that his, if his people were tested too much, in their ignorance and in their discouragement, they might choose to go back to Egypt and be enslaved again which is what they would try to do in less than two years from this point. So God in his wisdom took them on a different path. Here's what I want you to know. You and I are currently experiencing God's gracious, loving provision and guidance. We lack for nothing, regardless of appearances or our limited understanding. You're gonna tell me that your current circumstances don't make any sense? I'm going to tell you that you find yourself in good company according to God's holy word. Nonetheless, we walk by faith and not by sight. The Lord is with us, and we are experiencing his blessing. Now let's talk about our past. Joseph's bones reminded God's people that any current or future reality would be based on God's faithfulness to his promises made to people long ago. See, Joseph understood the promises of God to Abraham. He believed and trusted that someday the Israelites would leave Egypt and take their place in the promised land. In Genesis chapter 50, on his deathbed, Joseph made his brothers promise that his remains would be brought out of Egypt and buried in the promised land with those of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. That promise endured through the centuries and now he was being carried up out of Egypt. Joseph's bones were transported to the promised land. Now I want you to think about that. Somebody had to carry his remains. And it wasn't a short trip. It lasted 40 years. Someone every day was responsible for burying the bones of Joseph so that they could reach the land of promise. God's ancient promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were believed by Joseph and were now being fulfilled. His remains were a visible, daily reminder of the past that God keeps his promises. In Joshua chapter 24, Verse 32, after the end of the conquest, when they take possession of the promised land, it says, And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the fathers of Shechem. And Shechem will be on the test, so I hope you wrote that down. Here's what I want you to know. You and I carry the faith hopes, and sacrifices of those who went before us. They did not live to see the fulfillment of all God's promises, but they remained faithful, and we have received their legacy. And I'm going to tell you that what you are doing now is investing in a future that you're not going to be around to see. And if that's going to make sense to you, you have to accept that somebody invested in your current reality. And they're not around to see it anymore. So I want you to think about whose memory or whose bones do you carry with you? Who sacrificed and served so that you and I could live in this current reality? Whose memory are you honoring today? As we move forward, remember that we carry their, their memory their sacrifices, 
and their legacies with us. And the last thing I want you to see is that Israel's future would emerge as they followed God into the unknown with both faith and obedience. We make a big deal about this pillar of fire and pillar of cloud, and it must have been something to see. It was a visible symbol of God's presence to guide and protect the Israelites in the wilderness, and it represented his, his presence among his people both day and night. It went ahead of them. It, the, 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 the presence of God led them, and it represented God's leadership as they moved through unknown territory. By reason of being guided by the pillar, the Israelites knew all day, every day, that God was present with them. In the Numbers chapter 9, it says that the people camped wherever the cloud stopped, and they stayed there until the cloud moved on. They constantly followed the leadership of God. As your pastor, I want to tell you that in my time here, very little unfolded according to plan. <laughs> and yet, God has been with us. And it's so important that we continue to trust the Lord as we move into the future. The future will unfold as you and I remain close to God, pay attention to his leading, and follow with faith and obedience. Our present and our past demonstrate that God can be trusted. Amen. See, uh, the testimony of this church, as I've been saying for a few weeks now, is that we have been seized by the power of a great affection. And Jesus Christ reveals God's love to us through the cross, which forgives our sin. God gives us his word and his spirit to guide us each day. We respond in love with our faith and our obedience. This explains the history of our church. The people who started this, who started over after the 1919 hurricane, they were seized by the power of a great affection. It's the only thing that makes sense of the lives they live. It's the only thing that explains our present, and it is what will dictate the future of the church. I do not think the local church, or this specifically, this church is a waste of your time or effort or resources. What's been made manifest in our history, what's true right now, is that we have been seized by the power of a great affection. And because the love of Christ has taken hold of us, Everything is different for us. His story has now become our story. Grace becomes our experience in what we offer to others. And regardless of our circumstances, what they seem like, we trust the Lord and we keep going and we experience the peace that passes understanding and the joy that fills our hearts because Christ is with us he has always been with us, and his kingdom endures forever. We have a song we want you to uh, pay attention to, and then we'll be done. I cannot explain the ways of love Life cannot explain the grace of kindness There's no reason that can satisfy enough The healing of this blindness I've been seized by the power of a great affection I've been seized by the power of a great affection And even in the days when I was young There seemed to be a song beyond the silence The feeling in my bones was much too strong 
to just deny I can't deny this I've been seized by the power of a great affection Seized by the power of a great affection Now this is the theme of my song Just stand and sing a hymn of commitment. And today, I put a couple of things before you to think about while we sing. First of all, I invite you to be seized by the power of a great affection. If that's not a testimony that describes your experience, I encourage you today to think about what that means. That God loves you with a great affection that changes our lives and our eternal destinies, and we love him back with a great affection. Let that be your story today. Secondly, I invite you to live in the reality that his kingdom has no end by making a commitment to your local church, whichever church that is, if it's this one or another one. Live in the present, carry the legacy of the past, and follow God into the future with faith and obedience. Why? because his kingdom has no end. So I'm going to pray for us, and then Alan Ray will come and lead us in a, in a hymn of commitment. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that the testimony of this church is that you seized us with the power of a great affection. And Lord, from one generation to the next, in good times and bad, we've made a commitment to fashion our lives as a loving response to what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. And I pray now, Lord, you would help us to trust you. I pray that you would help us to bear the memories of those who went before us and to live in their legacy. And then, Lord, help us to follow you with faith and obedience into the unknown of the future so that we might leave our own legacy behind. 
And Lord, I pray that you would bless all of those here. Help them now to comprehend what it means to be loved by a great affection. And may our response bring glory to you. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me while we sing? happen to be a visitor today, we're glad you visited with us. We normally don't worship for two hours, <laughs> nor do we typically pass the offering plates with big blue buckets. I got tickled at that, too. Um, our Deacon of the Week is Jerry Brundrett, who's going to come and close us in prayer. And Jerry, I'd ask if you'd also bless the food we're going to have. And I hope that you've made plans to stay for lunch. It's over in our gym, and there'll be people over there to help you to know what you to do. Uh, when you get over there. Let's eat, okay? So Jerry, would you come? Close us in prayer. Before I pray, I want to say that the Lord spent about three hours with me this morning telling me what he wanted me to say, but we don't have time for that <laughs> because we need to get over and eat that food. We don't want to hurt the lady's feelings. So if you'll join me as I pray. Father God, what are we going to take out of this place? Have we been seized by the power of a great affection? There's many things I could say right now. The history of this church for 150 years has been stained by the sweat and blotted by the tears of those faithful who have kept us together. And Lord, we are the future that are here right now. And we're going to go out into the world. We're going to take a message. What message are we going to take? Unless we've been seized by the power of the great affection, we don't have a message. And there's bound to be somebody here right now that needs to make a decision. Don't walk out of this auditorium this morning unless Jesus is on board. Like the old preacher once said, if Jesus ain't on board when the ship sails, it's too late. And that time is short. And Lord, we need you. And out of everything that was said today, something that resonated with me that says it all is Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. All those that journey soon or late must pass within the garden gate, must kneel alone and solemn there and struggle with some deep despair. Lord, have mercy on those who cannot say not mine, but thine, who only pray. Let this cup pass and cannot see your purpose in Gethsemane. And Lord, we're all going to pass within that gate. And we just pray that we can say, not mine, but thy will be done. So as we leave here and we go to partake of the blessings that's been prepared for us, we pray that you would bless the food, Bless those that prepare it. Bless those that eat it for one purpose, and that's so we can serve you the way you called us to serve. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
at our closing hymn.